Wonderful. Well, first and foremost, let me say thanks to, thank you to everybody for coming out tonight. Um, you know, this is uh, my first time in Munich. It's been really great thus far. But you probably don't want to hear me just sit and talk about how great Munich is. You all already have a good idea. So let's talk about CoreOS. So I guess starting out here, uh, my name is Brian Redbeard. Uh, you know, I used to have this giant beard hanging down my chest. I actually uh, have competed in a few of the world beard and mustache competitions. Uh, <laughs> the Germans, they always, they always uh, bring a hard game. But uh, so speaking, let's start out here. So first and foremost, CoreOS. That's why you're here. Um, some of you may or may not be aware, but uh, CoreOS is not Chrome OS or Chromium OS. It's not related to those. It's not a fork of any of those. The big thing is, is that they share the same SDK. So that's where some of the confusion comes from. And then also we share the same update protocol. Um, but they're built, you know, completely separately of each other. Um, so that's just a little bit of, of history on that. But why? Let's get into the, like, why CoreOS exists. So there's two major motivations here. Uh, the first one, you know, was the, the very original goal of, like, securing the internet. And that's, you know, <laughs> like, wow, if, if, if you're going to dream, dream big. Um, but, you know, to give a little bit more context for how that starts to happen, you know, if you look back to... Uh, like other similar issues, and you start with HTML5. Um, in 2008, the proposed ratification date for HTML5 was going to be 2022. And in 2014, that was revised back, or 2011, that was revised to 2014. And it realistically, if you look at HTML5 at this point, it's fully implemented. So it becomes a question of how do you actually get to that point? Like what were the driving forces that allowed you to take this entire specification that was going to take uh, you know, 14 years and cut that in half. And the biggest driver behind it, in all honesty, is the Chrome browser. You know, Chrome started shipping this self-updating binary where uh, you know, they started with the, under the guise of like, we're pushing patch fixes, we're pushing you know, things to make the experience better for the user. And then well, when you're already doing the self-updating process and you can push patch fixes, you can also carefully start to ship out feature enhancements as well. And it allows you to drive forward at a much more rapid pace the adoption of certain technologies. And you know, the idea is that the browsers figured this out. It's, it's fascinating. Like you're, you're sitting here going, you know, technology, this idea that it starts accelerating at a faster and faster pace, and the first thing to, like, really cause the most recent leap forward without, you know, taking into account things like Wi-Fi is a web browser. So in the course of three years, the adoption time is cut in half. So we started thinking, like, what would happen if you could do this with other pieces of software? <laughs> You know, what, what would happen in that case? And you know, so much of the actual internet is just this situation where someone stands up a server, they get their application running, and then they never touch it again. You know, uh, our founders actually refer to that as being the slumlords of the internet. You know, it's you've built this house, you get your tenants in it, and then as soon as the tenants start paying you, you put absolutely no more effort into keeping their, you know, the place that they live in good shape. So, but that's not the only reason why we started looking at this. The second reason was we started looking at, like, how do companies like Google and Facebook and Netflix actually build out their infra in infrastructure? Pardon me. How do you get from A to B on that? You know, what does it look like? You know, so realistically, if you look at CoreOS, you know, we've got a lot of folks that have either come from larger companies or have come from, like myself, my background is in being a consultant. So I would go into very, very large companies and see how they ran their infrastructure. And that taught me a lot of lessons about both what to do and what not to do. So you start to look at where enterprises are actually at. And the first thing that you realize is that they have a lot of baggage. 
You know, they are doing things in these really non-optimal ways. And what that actually looks like is you purchase hardware, you build this monolithic app, the monolithic app has a failure or is running slow, so the solution to that is you just buy more hardware. And then you keep doing this. And then the people who were like really good at maintaining that application leave, and some kid fresh out of college walks in, and they start tearing out their hair, and they go, oh god, how do I even maintain any of this? And the solution is, well, the people before you just bought more hardware, so we're just going to keep doing that. You rinse and repeat. So to take a small tangent, you know, we're, we're going to fork this branch, and then we're going to merge the, the fork back again. Um, if you take a look at uh, Heroku, actually, Heroku started to define this idea of a 12-factor application. You know, so this application that would be maintainable, that you would be able to drive forward in the future. And you know, how do you actually build this? And some of the stuff was like, you, know, you uh, make sure that everything can horizontally scale. Uh, you separate your build and your run stages. You, know, you don't have your configuration in your code. That way, I can take my code and I can deploy it in testing, I can deploy it in staging, and I can deploy it in production, and it's the same exact code in each location. And the only thing that changes the idea about that in every single location is the configuration itself. You separate the state from that as well, so that now, uh, if something goes down, the state is not tied in the location of the actual code. There's one application I love picking on for this, because it makes it so easy, and that's WordPress. WordPress is a wonderful piece of software. I have used it extensively over the years, but when you actually analyze how it has been architected, it's designed in such a way where state is stored in a SQL type database, which is kind of notorious for not being able to horizontally scale. And the best answer to like, making sure that the data is available in multiple locations is you set up this chained replication sequence. So now you make an update to the master, the master starts pushing the changes down that chain. And if the master breaks, you break that replication, you point your application at the next sequence in the chain, and you just keep on working. Uh, the other thing that WordPress does is it stores its session information in the local PHP cache, which that's local to the machine. And if you start putting that inside of a container, that's local to the container. So how do you quickly fail over from one to another or even load balance acro that across those? Now, they've bolted on some additions over the years to make it so that you can now store the session information, for example, inside of Redis or Memcache, you know, so that you can replicate it. But they still have the issue of, well, you store files on disk. You know, the, uh, a lot of, if you upload files, they don't directly have a lot of support for pushing those into like an object storage like S3 or Google Compute. They just sit on disk on the machine. And now if that machine goes down, your files are unavailable. So the idea is to start building applications that push the data off into other locations and use the kind of Jeff Bezos proposed like microservices model where everything talks to each other as a network service. So that's what a 12-factor application is. So the idea that we started thinking of was what would happen if you took the ideas of a 12-factor application and made that a 12-factor operating system? You know, what does that start to look like? And, and what that starts to look like is that you have a number of hosts where they are saving as much state as possible into a centralized location. You run your applications inside of containers, and now the containers become something that can go back and forth between any host, and it doesn't really care. And the containers expose their location out to some sort of service discovery. So here's, this, this is an interesting idea in theory. How do you actually implement it in practice? So the way that we actually achieve this is first and foremost, you containerize your applications. And we specifically use this generic term and have tried to always use this generic term because containers are nothing new. Containerization has been around for a long time. Like anybody who's done work on, you know, like an old AIX server, an LPAR is a container. That's what it is. Like, yes, there are other companies that have created some 
really sexy technology that was implementing LXC and then, you know, standing on the shoulders of OpenVZ and, you know, a little bit of the lineage gets lost in history there. But, you know, we don't care whether or not it's systemd nspawn or Docker or Rocket. You just want to have some sort of containerization mechanism so that that application can be deployed on any host and it doesn't really matter, like it's uh, abstracted from the underlying host. The second thing that you do in our case is you have this self-updating operating system. Now you don't have to worry about having an administrator log into a machine, having that machine actively pull out and confirm the updates and everything. You need to find some mechanism for safely pushing the updates so that you don't have to worry about if something goes wrong. Like, for many, many years before working at CoreOS, I worked at Red Hat. And, you know, there were mechanisms that you could do inside of that to set up a yum, ju uh, a yum update via cron, and they work pretty well. But if for some reason that yum update fails, what's your recovery model? You know, you can take snapshots of the disk using LVM, and then you can try to revert the snapshots, which, I'll be completely honest, is kind of what we're doing, and I'll explain that here in a minute, but you need to have some preparedness plan, and that's not built into the operating system. It's not something that really defines that as a design pattern that everybody uses. So we thought it was really important that that be one of the first principles that we build on. On top of that, you know, we talked about this idea of divorcing state from the machine and how do you uh, have a situation where you can now safely update a whole cluster of machines. So you have to have some tooling to do that. And to get into more detail, the first thing that we're going to talk about is the application container. So I assume that most everybody here understands the concept of that, but for those that don't, we're going to talk about it real quick. So this is a traditional Linux distro. Doesn't matter, you know, whether this is Slackware, which was my first distro, or, you know, Red Hat or Ubuntu. The whole idea is that the distro manages a majority of these components, and all you have to worry about is your application. The distro will determine the version of the kernel, and the version of SSH, and also the version of Python. And what that means is that if you're on that Red Hat or CentOS system, and it's CentOS version 6, which was released in 2007, you will run Python 2.7. That's it. There is no workaround for that. You know, you've got some application that needs a newer version of Python. Well, if you update it, yum is going to break. And now you can't get any other updates. So what do you do? You get into these weird situations where you build Python yourself and you stick it in a secondary location and now all of your scripts need to be modified so that they are exposing the version of Python in an environment variable so that you can use user bin env Python because if you have just put the shebang at the top that says user bin Python, well, that's system Python. And Red Hat has had answers to this through you know, the development of software collections, but it is still this bolt-on kind of attitude. Like, how do you package that in a consistent fashion that it is more distributable? Because if my application cares about the version of Python, or it cares about the version of MySQL, I now need to bring this with me anyways. This isn't something that I can actually let the vendor manage. So if the vendor is not providing utility there, why don't you just move the line of what a distro actually is? Like, you know, really, if I care about the version of OpenSSL inside of my application because I'm using that for license generation, I don't want to worry that the vendor is changing that version out from under me. And there's no real reason for that. You know, or if I really, really want to be running Java 1.8 right now, you know, Java is actually one of the more portable examples for all of its foibles of, you know, having a situation where you know, you define a Java home, and now everything exists in a semi-common location at that point. So it is more portable, and you don't, you know, I would almost go so far as to say that the majority of individuals don't install their vendor or their distro's version of Java. Like, you know, if you're running actual Red Hat, you can install Bia's version of Java or Sun's version of Java, you know, directly from their distros, but not many people actually do that. They go to 
java.com and grab that and actually use it because they don't want to have to worry about whether or not Ice-T has fully implemented the specification to the way they expect to be able to use it. You know, ha and and how, many, how many companies really, really build actual J2EE applications where they only conform to that spec and are completely portable? Everybody uses a little bit of the like kind of vendored components there. So what is our answer to containerization? It's Rocket. And I'm not going to really talk about Rocket because Jonathan's going to talk about that next. And, you know, he's got awesome stuff to show you, and I don't want to steal his thunder. So we're going to jump on to the next portion, which is this atomic update, this process of pushing out an update to something and discussing how that update is actually applied. So I use that Android image here. We'll, we'll leave the, the iPhone out of it for a minute. But though the iPhone does do an atomic update as well, you know, it actually updates the entire operating system all in one go. You know, they both happen in that way. So it was very intentional. But the way that this actually works in regards to how CoreOS push, pushes an update or how even you push an update from your private instance, which is uh, one of the things that, you know, Nobody really wants to hear, but I'll talk about that, and it'll make our salespeople really happy at the end of it. But, um, you know, you have this idea that there's an update server, and your client calls home to the update server, and it sends across a very, very limited amount of information. It sends across the application ID. It sends across the version of the application that it's running. That's it. Oh, and it sends across, like, a UUID for the machine. It does not send IP address information. It does not send usable tracking information. It's just this very basic telemetry about what the host is actually doing and what the host is looking for information on. So within the Omaha protocol, which is the protocol designed by Google for the updates of these other applications, uh, and I actually gave a presentation about this at FOSTEM a few days ago, so for folks who are interested in Omaha protocol, they'll have a, uh, the video of that up. Uh, with, within the Omaha protocol, you define an application ID, which is just a UUID, and then you specify information about how or where the updates for that application come from. And at the core tenant of it, you don't want to rely on SSL existing. And that seems a little weird at first, but the idea is that everything is actually signed by a GPG key, and the idea that the client can trust GPG more than it trusts SSL. In our case, we're not shipping anything that's confidential or sensitive information, so we don't care if anyone sees the data in transit. We only want to verify that it hasn't been modified when it gets there and that it's actually signed by the individual or the organization that that application came from. So you send across this application ID, you send across the version, and you send across your UUID. So I'm machine number one. I send to the server saying, I am run, running version 500, and uh, this is my application ID. So I'm running application number 10, I'm machine number one, and I'm running version 500. The update server then says, aha, you're only running version 500. We now have version 575 out. Here is a URL where you can download that from. The machine now the client itself uses that base URL and expects certain files to be in place at that location. It expects to be able to find the update via a predefined file name. It also expects to take that file name and add .sig afterwards to get the armored signature for GPG to validate that. And then there are other things that you can do there as well. So we also have additional files that have metadata about that file. It has, you know, SHA-512, 256, and MD5 hashes, each of that file, that are also signed by the same public key. So now we can use an arbitrary URL to pull that update from, and it doesn't matter whether it came from the... I was going to say the NSA. I don't want to be pulling updates from them anyway. But it doesn't matter whether it came from, you know, a malicious individual or not, because hypothetically, since everything is signed and assuming that we trust GPG, which I personally do, as long as you've got a long enough amount of entropy and bit length, uh, which, just as a side note there, did anyone hear about uh, 
some of the attempts at cracking GPG messages from the early 90s. Uh, when folks you know, were first implementing PGP, uh, they were using it on Usenet. And it would be a situation where you would have you know, a group of people who the message was intended for, and you would just post this to Usenet, and who cares if it's out in the wide, wide open? Well, at that time, they were using really short key lengths, like they were using 256-bit or 384-bit key lengths. And finally, someone decrypted one of those messages. You know, it's taken 20 years to do that. And the content of the message was, if you've cracked this, you were wasting your time. <laughs> So, you know, we use a much, much longer key length for our stuff. But, um, you know, and, and even at that, the whole idea is, again, not that the information is private, but only that we're guaranteeing that it hasn't been modified. So now that you have this location, of, you know, have this URL where you can download an update from, the machine downloads it. And it downloads the metadata, and then it starts doing a verification on its local disk. Uh, inside of CoreOS, there is the public key which all of our images are signed with, baked in. On top of that, this is sitting on a read-only file system that has partition flags set so that you cannot remount it read-write. On top of that, we then you know, had this situation where we were still worried about somebody going in and hex editing the actual disk and modifying the content there. So we've started using DM Verity to actually sign all of the individual files. So now even if you go in and sign that, there's a kernel module guaranteeing that the checksum is in place and that nothing's been messed with. We're really paranoid. So um, finally, and this is the part that freaks out some people a little bit but I'm happy to talk about it. We also send back some additional metadata to the update server. And it's really, really important that that happens. So now that the client has downloaded this update, at every single stage, it's letting the update server know what, what is happening. So with that UUID for the machine, you say, I'm request or here is what I'm running. I'm requesting an update. I've downloaded the update. I have the update on disk. I've validated the update. I've applied the update, I've rebooted, and I'm running the new version. What that means is now that much like an Android, uh, like a mobile provider who does over-the-air updates, we have this anonymous information about the progress of an update. So when we go to actually push out an update, we really started out very, very slow. We'll start pushing it so that one machine gets updated every five minutes. And when you consider the sheer number of CoreOS instances that are all hitting this host, that's not, <laughs> you know, it's, it's infinitesimally insignificant. But we're able to then see that that one machine goes through the process and is successful. And then we expand that to two machines every five minutes, and then three, and then two machines every minute, and then five machines a minute, and finally to the point where it gets to, you know, just don't rate limit it. And what that does is it allows us to watch the update process, and I apologize for folks who are going to have a hard time seeing this, but we can watch the update go like that, to the point where everything gets updated all at once. And if we see here that those machines aren't updating, we can stop the process, we can hit that panic button, and we can keep anything else from having a failed update. Now, even if there is a failed update, we have a backup plan. And that's the partition scheme that exists inside of CoreOS. And it's very opinionated. I, I have to admit, everything about CoreOS is very opinionated. We are not a general purpose distribution. We get a lot of folks coming to us going and saying, so I tried apt getting this new package. No, no, no. It's not gonna work, it's not gonna work. Or, Where's GCC? I want to put GCC on the box. And we have to kind of explain to people this mentality that this is for running a workload. It's not for, per se, developing your workload. It's not for, uh, you know, a general purpose, like I said before. You know, that's, there's been this sad situation where over the course of Linux being more and more actively developed, folks much like you know, a lot of internet technologies, as it becomes more ubiquitous, and as it becomes easier to use, it is less understood. So folks 
have kind of lost the idea of a static binary and what that is. They don't, you know, nobody thinks, oh, well, I'm going to be able to take this binary that was compiled to run on this system and just move the binary and expect that it's going to work. But there was a day where that was the case. And, you know, if you're designing things to run inside of a container, you bring all of the dependencies with you so that container acts like a static binary. And, you know, if you have a programming language, which re that's, you know, the idea of packing in those dependencies so that it is truly portable is there, then things just work out of the box. So Go is a great example of that. Um, Kelsey from our team and John are both heavy, heavy Go developers. So you know, feel free to ask them questions about that if you've got answers, or ask them questions if you want answers. But um, the, the idea with Go is that everything becomes this static binary. So you can just wget that down and put it on a host, and then wget down the signature of that file and validate that it is actually signed by the person who you think that it came from. And you can trust running that as long as you trust the developer. You know, we, I don't trust many people, but, but I promise to talk about the partition scheme, so let's get into that. So on a CoreOS host, you have this A partition and this B partition. These are those read-only partitions that I was talking about before. So when you install CoreOS for the first time, you will be running off of the A partition, and then all of your data sits in this read-write partition. A is just slash user. So that is the area that is, you know, impossible to touch anything in. So when a new update comes down, we download this update to uh, tempfs, or slash temp, which by default is tempfs. And then we're going to apply that into that B partition. The way that we do that is actually just smashing it onto the disk. So if you think back to that, so we've got this idea where the GPG keys are baked in there. We're going to force down this new image, and then we're going to load from it, and we're going to check that it's actually signed by who we think it came from. And assuming it is, then we'll be able to load from that. But to guarantee that that pivot can happen easier, you know, if you download that update, and you apply it, and you reboot and run off that, and everything's great, you just keep running off of this B partition. But, and I can speak from first-hand experience, it doesn't always go that way. We had a situation at one point where the uh, system D developers didn't document everything as well as we would have liked in the change log. So they, the location of some files moved, and we had machines that when we pushed that update, they failed. And I was explaining before that like, you know, in the situation of updating a yum machine, you have to have a backup plan. Any time that you're going to have this self-updating process, you've got to have a backup plan. So our backup plan is that we have a grub module that utilizes metadata on the GUID partition table. So the GUID partition table, a lot of folks don't realize you can actually store metadata in the partition table. So we have metadata that uh, explains the number of times that we have attempted to boot the machine the number of times it has failed, and the priority of that. So this grub module actually looks at the metadata on that and makes a decision about which one to load. And if this partition fails to load, it's going to increment that metadata so that the next time it attempts to reboot again, it looks at that and it goes, oh, something's not right. But because we have this known good partition over there that we started from, we can pivot back to it and everything's fine. Yes, there's a question. How do you actually tell that uh, a new update is really good or bad? So that is actually the process. So the question was for anyone who's watching here, how do we actually tell an update is really good or really bad? And you know, for the most part, it's going to be, we're mainly worried about does the kernel load? Does the kernel load? And then after the kernel, does system deload? And then... At that point, it gets a little bit shaky because we don't want to be looking at the content of what anyone is actually doing. So the system itself will notify you if it's having a problem loading actual systemd units. But for the most part, if you get the kernel up and you get systemd loaded and systemd hasn't changed anything major, everything will continue to operate 
in a semi-standard fashion. Now, we also realized in doing some testing recently with uh, glibc 2.19, they actually changed part of how get host by name works. So we were able to detect that because machines weren't actually, they were failing during part of the boot process um, where uh, get host by name was attempting to run, it was returning invalid data, system D was reporting that data back um, because it was in glibc in that case and we were able to figure that out and, and recover. But um, it is something where those are the major components that we're worried about because in most situations, if those are working, everything else will continue to work, especially if there's a container there. You may have a problem where if the SSHD developers break something, then SSHD might not be there. But with that pivot process going back and forth, if we need to do another update because we've detected that that was a problem, we will download it, stage it, and attempt to use partition B again and just overwrite the data that was there before. So we do a lot of testing around that as well. So you know, when bugs like that happen, generally we're the first ones to notice. And it's not something where we're using this update process and the world writ large as canaries. Like That's the last thing that we actually want to do. So I mentioned the, the init system that we're using there. And the init system, the process that is controlling everything, the process that's keeping an eye on everything, is system D. So system D is this init system that does a few other things as well. Um, it's very contentious for some people. We happen to really, really like system D a lot. Uh, and it's leveraged us to do things in a consistent fashion. That's part of that. If system D loads correctly, we have assurance that the following pieces are there working. You know, you don't really worry about if cron is working. I mean, most people don't really worry about if, if cron is working, but um, it gives a lot of other benefits as well. So let me show you an update here. So this is a like comparison of a uh, sys5 init startup script and a systemd startup script. Now, you know, lots of, every time I show this slide, immediately a hand shoots up and they go, those are all just comments. <laughs> well, it is technically correct. Yes, they are comments but they are extremely important comments. They're comments that support telling a Red Hat system how to actually use that, or a Debian system, or an LSB-based system. I mean, there's a lot of actual stuff embedded there. And that also kind of shows, like, we have these, this comment-based metadata just to support a bunch of different operating systems. And you have to have 20 lines of that metadata before you even get to the point of setting environment variables to use to load your unit correctly. And then if you go down another 200 lines in the file, that's where you get to the point of setting up your process. And by that point, you've the init system, or the, sorry, the startup script hopefully knows about whether the process is a forking process, whether or not it's a process that runs in the foreground, whether or not it's a double forking process. And each one of those kind of has to be managed by the developer and, or has to be understood by the systems administrator. In the case of a process that forks to the background, or you know, kind of no matter what, this sys5 init script requires the administrator or the developer to manage the PID file for it, and manage any other sockets that it may need and go through all of this other stuff. Which, as someone who has lived in a production workload for a very, very long time, I've had to write these. That's what I wanna do. I wanna have 10 lines that makes this process run in the foreground and if that process fails for some reason, restarts it for me. Like, I don't want to have my init system start daemon tools so that daemon tools can start my bind server to be paranoid about whether or not bind's actually going to fail. I just want the init system to run it. Like, just make my life easier. And that's what systemd is doing here. Like, systemd handles the idea of just saying, oh, run this as this user and group. Oh, you need to start this other process before this one? 
well, I will understand your dependency tree as well. And I'll understand that you need this disk mounted to provide this path to be able to provide these files. And if that entire chain is broken, or if the first portion of that is there, don't try to start the thing and now just flap in this loop. Like, be intelligent about this. That's what system D is actually providing. So, whew, calm down. I get real excited about system D. That, that part of that's because, you know, like I said, I used to work at Red Hat, so I've had system D just like drilled into my head for a very long time. But next up, how we actually coordinate passing information around when you start getting to other hosts, that ends up being etcd. So what etcd is, is it's, it's this highly available key value store. We're just going to start with that, highly available key value store. So that means that if I have some cluster of machines and things start going weird, I know about the state of everything. And if a machine comes back and I have quorum again, I can recover. And if that machine goes down again and things become unavailable, it doesn't mean that my data is not available. It fails to kind of this read-only state. You only want to be able to write data to a cluster if you know that the data can be replicated and you know you have quorum. If you lose quorum, you want things to be generally in this state. Or you want it to be in a state where the application can decide, ah, the key value store does not have quorum. I personally would rather have no data than stale data so I can make the decision to fail to this safe state. There are other applications, on the other hand, where stale data is okay. If you're running a giant Cassandra infrastructure that, as a part of its design principle, is that it's eventually consistent, stale data is okay. Because you can still start to get into that bootstrap process and figure it out afterwards. So this is a key value store that understands how to operate in both of those types of environments. And it's a key value store. It's extremely simple. Like, using command line utilities, you can make a directory, and then you can set values in this directory, and then you can set values referencing other values, and then when it's time, you retrieve the information. And the semantics of all of this are actually based on HTTP. You do a get to get a value. I know it's real revolutionary, I understand, but... And as you saw previously, you, you start to use this for shared configuration. You know, I care about knowing that Ganon and Zelda are these hosts and the current one is Zelda. Zelda is the master. So you can also use this to start coordinating uh, the actual locking in a cluster. And what I mean by that is that this is a coarse locking service. You're not going to use this to maintain the actual locking of a file, but if you had like a Postgres cluster, and this is something that folks over at compose.io, it's compose.io, right? Yeah, they're using etcd to manage this multi-master Postgres setup where they know who the master is and are storing that in Postgres so that you can contact any Postgres system to do a read, but only the writes go to the Postgres master. So they wrote a proxy, and that proxy looks, does introspection on that and routes the actual requests. So now you can start to get to this point where dumb services become more intelligent. And you can get to this point where really smart services become geniuses. That's where we're trying to take this. And this ends up being the process for doing service discovery, and locking. Because locking is a lot more important than folks necessarily think it is. You know, if you're a programmer, you understand the, on, the, the concept of taking a mutex and making sure that, you know, no, no other process stomps on your lock while you have that mutex. But for servers, it's still catching up a bit. And that's why we wrote Locksmith. Locksmith is just a reboot manager. You know, and it uses etcd for the transport of that lock information. And then 
Locksmith works in tandem with Update Engine, which is the process that calls out to see if there's an update. So now, if there's an update that comes down, it, uh, Update Engine is passing messages across Dbus, and Locksmith can listen for the messages on Dbus. If the system needs to go down for an update, Locksmith contacts etcd and says, okay, entire cluster, what are you doing right now? And in, in that key space, it can look and see, are there any machines currently with a lock on a reboot? And if there is a lock on the reboot, the machine just hangs out and waits until that lock is released. If there's not, it can go ahead and act on that and reboot into that. Because the last thing that you want to see is you've got this cluster of machines and you've got these applications spread across the cluster and a machine running a process hasn't had a pr chance to eject that across to another one and everything just reboots at once. So to really dumb this down, what it's doing is it's acting as a semaphore for reboots. Like 30,000 foot view, that's what it's doing. And it's kind of weird when you think about it that we are in the second decade of the 21st century and there hasn't been a common pattern of doing this yet. You know, that's mainly because folks have gone, oh, well, you run, you run a process on a system and the system stays up and running. Because let me tell you, my uptime, my uptime is 1,800 days. I'm just saying. You know, I, Netcraft was awesome back in the day, and I loved being able to look at Netcraft and see, you know, you know. But realistically, the best thing I can say about that is that the world is evolving, we're coming a more egalitarian place, and I want to leave that type of penis envy behind. I'd, I'd rather be in this situation where, no, my, my machine rebooted because it needed an update, and it's now running up-to-date software, and, you know, I would rather have a new kernel that's been patched than run a kernel that has known root zero days. So <laughs> that's, that's just me. Y'all, you do you. Y'all can do it any way you want. But, um, so there, there's a few tunables here. So, you know, one is the maximum number of semaphores for that. Because if you've got a five machine cluster, this is going to work great out of the box. If you get to the point where you're running a 10,000 machine cluster, you probably want to run more than one update at a time. <laughs> Otherwise, you're kind of going to have a race condition on your updates. And, you know, some of them are going to be still waiting to do an update, and other ones are going to be two, three versions ahead. And on top of that, it also comes down to strategy, because this is not necessarily a one-size-fits-all pattern. You know, for some people, they just want things to get updated as fast as possible. Other organizations are a lot more conservative, and this supports that idea. You know, you can say, no, I only want you to reboot if you have successfully taken a lock. Other, other organizations are willing to, you know, run their things through a YOLO pattern where, you know, you just, we'll just do it and see how it goes. And, you know, the, the best effort is, you know, if etcd is running, then take that. But if etcd is crashed for some reason, I don't know why, or, you know, you can't make a network connection to it, well, then maybe we should just reboot. So, you know, that, that's all kind of built in together. So the first thing that generally comes up for individuals, if there is some problem, you know, because uh, etcd up to this point has been increasingly stable, but when we first released Locksmith, uh, folks had a, a few issues with it here and there, and, you know, there'd be a situation where, okay, well, Locksmith took a lock, and then the machine rebooted, and the lock wasn't released, and what do I do now? So Locksmith CTL is just a way for talking directly into that namespace within etcd and manually tweaking that process. And the nice thing is, is Locksmith CTL also allows you to build these custom locking strategies. So now, if you want to say, yes, not only sh do you require to have a lock in place to reboot, but you, we only want you to take a lock if this certain process has shut down cleanly. You can start scripting around this and you can build systemd units to have these more kind of coordinated 
uh, and advanced strategies. You know, you're, you're, you don't have to just rely on what we thought was good. Because I am a moron. I am not very smart. You know, you, you, I recognize that there are, smartest, there are way smarter people in the room. And I want to listen to them. And at the same time, I would rather have folks who come up with really awesome ideas share them. So if that's the case, we should be giving people the ability to do more advanced things and see what they come up with. Speaking of that, oh, yes. Is there a way to tell Locksmith that you want X percent of your servers to be updating at the same time? As a percentage, not directly, but you can query the number of machines in the cluster and you can then set the number of locks scripting around that based on it. So it is something where like etcd knows how many machines are kind of there. So you can use that to get a pretty good idea. Okay. Um, so, you know, speaking of that, you know, kind of the ideas of what Locksmith is doing, it's really important that we take a second to talk about orchestration. Now, uh, very early on, we created Fleet. So Fleet, uh, Jonathan was uh, one of the developers on. Um, and what it is, is it's just an abstraction layer on top of systemd that uses etcd to store systemd units. So fleet takes this systemd unit that should be run somewhere in that cluster, stores it in etcd. Etcd has it replicated to all of the etcd nodes. So now that information is highly available. And now, if a host needs to go down for an update, another host can read that information out of the cluster and execute on it and bring a copy of that service up and running again. So now that gives you the ability to start coordinating. Okay, I need to shut this process down. Before that happens, I should bring up another process. I should talk out to uh, you know, the load balancer to start doing a traffic bleed from A to B. I will say that's... That glue right there is not stuff that we have personally written because I don't know what load balancer you're running and your net scaler is going to be different than somebody else's F5 and we don't have all of the hardware you know, to write all of that glue. Now that being said, anybody who contributes it, we'd love to put it upstream. You know, we really work around that right now with some of the common software-defined load balancers like the one built into Amazon S3 and like the one built into Google Compute Engine. That's what we use internally for our processes. Um, but what Fleet ends up providing you is this central point of coordination and like a really dead simple method of orchestration and of monitoring. You know, we don't want to assume a lot of things on behalf of a user. Because there are realistically much, much more complex uh, scheduling systems and orchestration systems that do a lot more. And, you know, first and foremost, you know, you've got Kubernetes, um, which we've been doing a lot of development and collaboration with, uh, in, uh, along with both Google and Red Hat on that. And then there's also Mesos. Uh, yeah, there we go. I was like looking down, the slide hadn't loaded yet. So, you know. Mesos, which was uh, created over at Twitter uh, and then open sourced, uh, has had a large community building around it. You know, it's uh, you know one of the I would say more feature complete, especially in comparison to uh, existing tools, and it's extensible. You know, you can start switching out the scheduler. If you've got lots of long running processes, you can take those and run those under Marathon. You know, you uh, Mesos. And Kubernetes bo also both understand this idea of how utilized is a system. Fleet is not trying to solve these goals. You know, one of the things that we've ended up doing is we look at problems that need to be solved. And you've got two different organizations and two different competing pr projects solving that problem. There's no reason why we need to throw a third component of competition there. Competition is good, but when we can contribute our effort to working on that, or we can look at the problem of the 5 or 10 or 20 machine cluster that doesn't have those same types of complex requirements, and we can have an answer for that, which is fleet, you know, it makes more sense for us to broaden the diversity rather than just throwing in one more thing that has these ideas of uh, system uh, resource utilization and all that. Now, 
we have some things that we've built onto that through uh, metadata, the, the actual machine store, and uh, methods for fleet using that metadata to decide where a process should run. So this is where we'll use uh, Amazon AWS as an example. You've got five machines which are uh, high memory machines, five machines which are high CPU, and then two machines which are GPU instances. You tag each one of those with metadata that says, I'm GPU, I'm high CPU, I'm high memory. And now that process that needs the underlying NVIDIA GPU for that, you say only run on a machine that has the NVIDIA or the GPU metadata attached to that. And now that scheduling can become more intelligent, but you don't have to really get into the weeds of monitoring C groups and doing a lot of other stuff. So I'm getting towards the end of things here. Uh, this is where everybody can feel free to plug their ears a little bit when I start talking about um, the actual update service that, uh, or you know, the, the process that you know, we sell. Uh, and then after that, Jonathan's going to talk about Rocket, and then I'm going to come back and actually give a technical <laughs> discussion here. You know, it, uh, a lot of folks uh, you know, want to get a little more meat out of this, and I totally understand that. But you know, we wanted to make sure that everybody was on a level set playing field so that everything made sense after that. So the final thing that we're going to talk about is core update. So core update is the update server. This is a snapshot from a while ago from my uh, private update instance, um, because one of the things that core update does is if you can either just consume the upstream updates, or if you are at an organization where you want that man in the middle on it, where you can say, no, slow your roll. We want to uh, make sure that updates occur maybe a week after they come out, where we want to carve out custom groups so that in our production application, I have one machine that's running on the alpha, five machines that are running on the beta, and then everything else is running on stable. You can carve those up in such a way so that the update system serves updates intelligently. So now you have these ideas of canaries in your application. So now you can push that update to the one machine that's always running alpha, and then after a few days, if you haven't been seeing issues with it, you can push that update to the beta instances. And now they're all running the same code, but you have a much higher degree of assurance that that update model is working exactly how it was intended to. So that's what we need. And this is not something that you need this server to do. You today could attach to uh, the public facing CoreOS instances and just do that. You can say, Machine number one uses alpha, machines two and three use beta, everything else uses stable. But this is more for, I have carved out custom groups. So application A, or the machines running application A, they get updates at a different cadence than the machines running application B. Now this goes against my preferred model of pushing out updates and guaranteeing that everything actually gets updated. But realistically, I'm a pretty aggressive guy in that standpoint, and I understand that you know if you're SAP or you know you're SaaS, that you probably you know want to slow that down a little bit. And it's really just a generic Omaha updater. You heard me say at the very very beginning of things that Omaha protocol specifies an application ID when you request an update. So we did a quick proof of concept here where you know, CoreOS has this application ID with 2,000 machines running behind it on my, my instance. But then you know, we also wrote Omaha-based updaters for some of these components inside of OpenStack. OpenStack is notorious for being a pain to update. So you know, we took a look at this and we wrote updaters that could consume this application ID, could pull that update down and make use of it, and then intelligently update their software. You know, I'm, it's not a secret that our long-term vision is to give customers the ability to self-update their own software as well. I mean, that's, that's the natural evolution of what we're doing. And you know, that's probably going to look more like you are pushing an update for your container so that you can say, I want to push an update to all of these containers. But the beautiful thing about this is that it's not tied directly to that. You can do uh, things like, well, all of our customers are 
running Mac OS and we've got this desktop application and we want to push an update to that and we want to guarantee that everyone's running the same version, which, you know, for anybody who's maintained software in an enterprise, that's a really hard thing to do. And you can kind of do that with group policy on Windows, but for anyone who's been a GP administrator on Windows, it's not very fun. I'm happy that that's not something that I've had to deal with in a very, very, very long time. And finally, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing of why a lot of people like these is it gives you pretty graphs and stuff. So I can visualize here that, you know, at any, or when this was running, my alpha channel had 1,500 instances running. It was paused at the moment. You know, I hit the panic button just for the purposes of uh, taking the screenshot. But I have allowed 15 updates every 15 minutes. We have done it in such a way where you can say, update every n instances every m intervals. I guess I should have said n instances every i intervals, but, you know, and that can be, you know, minutes, hours, etc. So it gives you this full breakdown of what the ecosystem is running, while at the same time, when you go back and look at this, you know, it's this macro view also of, well, this, like this group of machines, we've had 300 or 275 machines update or uh, complete an update to version 324.3 .3 as of 7 a.m. UTC. So that's the idea there, is that you can get this overall view of the ecosystem of your environment without providing super detailed information. So, you know, what, kind of, what we're doing here is we're trying to build out systems in a radically different way than what has been traditionally done. You know, we, want, we don't want you to SSH into boxes and administer them. We want to provide you with APIs because as you get to the point where your application goes from 10 machines to 100 machines to 1,000 machines, you can't SSH into every single one of them and you can't do administration at that macro level. You've got to get a hold on how things start to work when you get to really, really large scale. And that means that, you know, things have to be done a different way. And we felt that it was about time that someone started providing a ramp to get to that place of operating things in that, fan, uh, that fashion a lot, lot easier. So with that, I will take a few questions here. Um, I will give Jonathan the chance to uh, go ahead and start setting his stuff up and... Oh yeah, well, I'll take questions, we'll have a break, then Jonathan can set up, but does anyone have questions? Man, I am that good. It feels good to be this good, I gotta say that, but... <laughs> yes, right there. Yes, CoreOS does have to reboot. We've tested some models where we use KExec to do a reload, but KExec has a lot of bugs, especially with passing the PCI table between two instances of a running kernel. Um, and that's something that we have, like we started out trying to use KExec. And um, we have been looking at some other mechanisms for handling that, but we haven't found anything that's stable enough to do that because we've done an extensive amount of testing. And, you know, also it makes a lot of sense. Like if we don't have to have folks reboot, why would we do that? But in that balance of being able to avoid a reboot or being able to work through that, we decided that the reboot was the better answer, especially because a lot of uh, individuals and organizations that are running CoreOS on a cloud platform, system D loads really fast. Like when I boot an instance in a VM on my laptop, it takes less than one second to go from post to running. So, you know, when you have this situation where uh, in, uh, containers can exist in different spots on the cluster and you can bleed traffic back and forth across them using a load balancer, it's a lot less painful. And we want to be in the situation where, you know, you're not afraid of that reboot. You know, that's the big thing that a lot of companies are paranoid about right now. You know, we want you to be in the situation where you run your updates at 11 a.m. on a Monday morning. You know, you've had enough time to get into the office, you've had a couple cups of coffee, you know, and then if there's an issue, you spend the rest of the day working on it and not the rest of the weekend. So that's kind of where we're trying to drive this. You had a question there as well. Follow up on that one is, uh, do you know on the stable branch how often 
updates or reboots have been required in the last while? Yeah, so the question, I need to remember to record it for the folks on the video. The, the question was as a follow-up to that, how often have updates roughly been re required or how long have reboots been required on that? So first, as I said, a reboot is required every time there is an update right now. And roughly the cadence of that update is every few days for an alpha, every few weeks for a beta, and about once a month for stable. So with that, it also gives me a good opportunity to say that alpha does not mean alpha software. It means you are receiving updates more often because you care about the newest versions of the stable software that you're running. On the mailing list and on IRC all the time, we get folks going, a new version of Docker came out. When's it going to be in stable? When it's had enough time to really be tested as stable? I mean, we realize that, like, yes, they released it as stable, but there's always a few bugs, you know, day one when you release a piece of software. So that's why the, the day that Docker comes out, we push that update into alpha. Now, the exception of that obviously being a security update. If there is a ghost type security update or shell shock or heart bleed or any of these others, we push those updates into that. And well, I'm sorry if you got a stable update three days ago, you're getting another one right now because we want to be in a more proactive situation about that. Yes, you have a question. So, uh, the question was, how do we handle the myriad of hardware configurations that you, can, that you can have on bare metal machines? And that's one where it's a lot easier than you think. So we ship a stable kernel. That's, and that is to say we ship not, even more specifically, not a stable kernel. We ship the stable kernel. We use the kernel.org kernel, which at this point every major hardware vendor pushes their patches for their hardware upstream. So it's only when you are doing kernel kind of version abstraction like Red Hat does, uh, where you have to then backport things. You know, for those of you who aren't available, if you are running a RHEL 7 machine, you know, RHEL 7 just came out uh, about six months ago, you are running a 3.10 kernel. In a year, you will be running a 3.10 kernel. In nine years from now, you will be running a 3.10 kernel. That's the way their versioning model works. And for every single patch that comes out, every new hardware addition that they do, every bug fix that they do, they backport it into that old kernel. And I can say from years of experience, I have a much higher degree of trust with using the kernel that the stable kernels are developing versus backporting software. Because I don't know if anyone's had to maintain a piece of software, but anytime you are doing an LTS style thing where you're trying to backport patches, you have a very high chance of regression. Doesn't mean that's gonna happen every time, but there is a chance of regression. And that happens less when you are marching forward with the stable. Because the stable, the, the kernel itself, is really just defining an application binary contract with the hardware to the software, and that contract stays stable. You know, I've taken software that I compiled for a Cobalt Rack 3, which was running on an AMD K62 processor on a 2.2 kernel, and I've taken that software, and I've run it on a 3.17 kernel. And it really exposes how much hardware does matter, because that software was not necessarily written to uh, abstract the speed of the hardware, so the ticks and stuff that it was doing were going way too fast, and the, there were problems with the software itself. But the software ran, and that was a program that I had written, and I am not a good software developer, which, for your benefit, that's why I am not one of the direct developers on CoreOS. I work on... <laughs> We've got, again, much smarter people working on this. Um, but... The, the whole thing is that, you know, by marching forward with that stable kernel, we haven't had any problems yet. So, uh, somebody over here had a question, I thought. A trick or lightning Ah, yes. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. So you can have problems with that. Okay. And the best way is to stick with the system that you're running rather than move to a new kernel because it runs on new hardware, mm -hmm. but it's often going to run. Okay. Um, so, so uh, you, can, you can run into situations like that mm -hmm. because uh, it's, a, it's a big place. Yes. So the the comment that we had was that uh, there are cases, you know, this gentleman has had situations similar where, you know, he has hardware or software that he's written that's very, very close to the underlying hardware, and you know, he has seen situations like that. Um, I will also say that in my experience, that's mainly been around, like I said, software that I've written, not necessarily software that's being maintained upstream or has to be main, maintained for a large number of architectures. Um, just because it's a similar boat where if you have to maintain software for a myriad number of architectures, like if you're trying to do support for both i386, i586, and uh, uh, I guess like uh, Z380, for example, you know, there are certain abstractions that you have to make to compensate for that. And, you know, if you're running, uh, you know, a PHP application or you're running something that was compiled, you know, my stuff, admittedly, was not even compiled using C99 because it was a 2.2 kernel. So there was, you know, certain benefits that came from programming languages as well, uh, or modern programming languages as well. Are there any more questions? Yes. Okay, we got two more. Yes. And cores take care of the operating system. Yes. I mean, our, our goal... If you draw the line between the two of them, does the uh, cores require to uh, have a, a container-like um, execution environment uh, in place, or can I run directly on core as well? You can run directly on core OS. What can I expect to have available as infrastructure? So... We are not providing any interpreted languages. The, uh, so, sorry. The question uh, was that, you know, uh, if our uh, suggested pattern for deploying an application is to run it inside of a container, does that mean that it's impossible to run software directly on top of CoreOS? And if it is not impossible, what can the application actually expect to have as infrastructure? Is that a good summary? Okay. So, the. Uh, for one, yes, you can directly run applications uh, on CoreOS. Uh, we have a customer called MemSQL where they write a an, uh, generic, or not a generic, they write a v compatible version of the SQL standard to MySQL, but it runs 100% in memory so that you get a much, much faster mode of operation and it clusters between machines automatically. So they run that directly on CoreOS for all of their uh, like QA and their uh, customers' production environments. I mean, they don't require you to run on CoreOS, but you know, they do a lot with that. Um, and they run that directly on the hardware. Now, that being said, we don't ship any interpreted languages at all. So your Python script will not run on a CoreOS host. You need to have a container with Python in it where that's brought along. You know, your statically compiled C binary or C++ binary or Go binary, that will definitely run. But we are not shipping a lot of libraries on the host, so you can't necessarily depend that those are there. If you, for example, create a directory called optlib and you place your shared libraries in optlib and then you update your ld.so.conf saying that, hey, I have shared libraries that will exist here, you can run whatever you want. But we don't have any packaging mechanism to do that because that's not how we personally feel that that should be done, but we're not doing anything to stop that. Like, you can still do that all day long. And we do actually have a mechanism for deploying all of that to make it easier, so you're not just out in the cold. Uh, so when I first started at CoreOS, um, one of the major problems that I recalled uh, from working directly with customers in the past was that if I had a mixed environment where it was bare metal and some type of cloud, be it public or private cloud, um, in the case of a uh, RPM-based system, the deployment mechanism for bare metal is kickstart. Like, that is de facto, that's what you do. And yet, 
uh, public cloud services have redefined what that is. Like you can't use a Kickstart file on Amazon AWS. While at the same time, if you have a defined cloud config, you can use a cloud config on AWS, you can use a cloud config on OpenStack, and that becomes more portable. So, as I mentioned, we don't ship any interpreted languages, so we had to re-implement cloud config in Go just to have it on the box. Um, and as a side note, it was really interesting to hear from folks on IRC saying thank you for doing that because I'm running an embedded system and I now know that I can uh, take that cloud config binary and I don't need to now include an interpreted language and I can have this mechanism for applying state to that uh, without baking it in. And so even on a bare metal machine, you can use a cloud config file. Now we use a similar pattern to an RPM based system where when you're booting that kernel, you give it an option that says cloud config URL equals and then some endpoint. And now it will talk to that endpoint as soon as the network coordination target is up because that's one of the other things from system D. Now the init system knows when the network is up, which is not something that was the case with sys5 init. So now that bare metal machine can use a cloud config and can deploy a piece of software in the same way that a cloud instance can, which means that you would be able to say, hey, here is some base64 encoded data that I want you to write down to disk. Here is a system D unit which will pull down some data over the network and can like curl it to the actual instance and use GPG, which is on the box, to actually validate that that content is correct. So there are ways that you can orchestrate that using cloud config, um, but we aren't giving you like a higher level package manager just at the core OS level. That becomes a container. Uh, did you have a question? So I'm gonna handle yours and then we'll come back to you, sir. Okay, bear with me. <laughs> so, the, the, the statement was, uh, will I publicly commit to shave my beard if, I have had a, if anyone here has a downtime of more than 12 hours? Um, so I will politely uh, defer on that. Uh, the last time I shaved my beard was actually, uh, this is less than a year. Uh, I did shave it off um, b uh, because I was tired. So in the U.S., there's this television show called Duck Dynasty, uh, which is about these... Uh, if I may, racist shitheads uh, who are bigots uh, across more than just racism. Uh, and I was tired of being associated with them, uh, so I, I took a hiatus from having a beard. Uh, the joke at the moment is that this is now my IPO beard, so I'll just you know, be maintaining this you know, for the long haul until that. But um, you know, we do everything that we can you know, to actively work with customers in the community. You know, we, like, I personally we'll probably be talking to you on IRC and, you know, answering questions and mailing lists and all over the place, so. <laughs> so, yes, your question. They are branches, yes. So, the, the version model of CoreOS is that every so through semantic versioning, you know, we will have a major, minor, and patch level for each one. So the nice thing about that is that there, is, there isn't this canonical idea of stable. There is the idea that stable currently points towards version uh, 522.0.0. And 522.0.0 was previously a beta and was previously an alpha. Yes, yes, because one of the other things that happens with Omaha protocol is that you cannot downgrade. So let me like explain this a little bit here and go back to the actual slide just to explain. So, you know, when you have a system, I talked about a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> so when you have a system with this AB uh, partition, you can only revert back as far as the last known good partition. And the reason for that is, is you don't want an attacker to be able to do a downgrade attack, where they force you down to a previous version that was still signed by us, but um, 
that has a known vulnerability in it. You don't want somebody to be able to force it down to something that has heart bleed in it where you can then do an attack. So um, that's the whole idea behind this kind of forward progressing uh, semantic model. Uh, one other thing, uh, and this will be the last uh, comment and then folks can take a break, go to the bathroom, get another beer, and I can rest my voice for a minute and listen to the dulcet tones of this man. Um, but uh, so when you see a, the CoreOS version number, like 575.0.0. That number, the first portion of it, is days since the CoreOS epoch. The CoreOS epoch is July 1st, 2013. That was the first date that we cut an actual CoreOS image. Um, you know, we'd been working on it before that, but that was the first day that we fully compiled it and, you know, booted an instance. Um, that's not to say that that was the first one that we released to the public, um, because, and that's also not to say that because there was a 575 that there is also a 4 and a 3 and a 2 and a 1, but it just, we use that as the base number. So that eventually will bite us in the ass, you know, you know, 20 years from now when we've got version number, you know, a mile and a half long. But, you know, that's, that's the idea of what that was. So... Thank you very, very much for uh, listening to me jabberjaw about this and go on and on. And, uh, uh, you know, feel free to come up and grab me during the break if you have more questions uh, or afterwards because we're going to be around here for a while.